Hey guys, Mr. O'Brien here. And in this video, we're going to describe how ecosystems change in response to natural and human disturbances. So this is going to be part six of your topic eight ecology chapter. And again, we're looking at both human and natural disturbances in ecosystems. So one of the big things and probably one of the big uh, buzzwords that you've been seeing over time is climate change. Now, climate change is an activity or some something that humans are doing that is going to rise the Earth's temperature. So many human activities from energy and food production to transportation increase the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Now, the, now the big one that we are looking at is CO2 or carbon dioxide. Now, CO2 is produced by uh, burning of fossil fuels. So if you see here, all of these factories are burning some sort of things. They're burning fossil fuels producing CO2. When you drive a car, your car, whether it be gas or diesel, is producing CO2. So this increased level of greenhouse gases is leading to an increase of overall climate temperature. Now, what is a greenhouse gas? So greenhouse gases are atmospheric gases such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and what they do is they trap heat energy near the surface of the earth, causing a phenomenon called the greenhouse effect. So in other words, our earth's atmosphere, let's just draw it in this layer right here, that earth's atmosphere traps heat, which is a good thing because without that, we would be like our, our neighbor planets like Mars and Venus, where their days are a normal temperature, but their nights are extremely cold. So what this greenhouse effect does is it traps the heat. Well, as we are increasing the more greenhouse gas, we're gonna start increasing the more um, heat that is trapped instead of being released out of it. So the more greenhouse gases we have, the more heat absorption we're gonna get. So solar radiation passes through this clear atmosphere. Most radiation is absorbed by the Earth's surface and warms it, but some of that radi radiation is reflected back out. So again, the more greenhouse gas we have, the more that's being trapped. Now here's just a graph that I found, and what this is is atmospheric CO2 concentrations at an observatory at Mauna Loa. Now Mauna Loa is in Hawaii. But the reason that they put it in a Hawaii is that it's actually far away from two things. Forests, which actually produce a large amount of oxygen, and cities, which produce a large amount of CO2. And what they've done since the early, or the late 1950s is, is record the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. And what's the overall trend? The overall trend is a steady increase in parts per million of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Now you're probably asking, why does the graph bounce up and down? Oops. Why does the graph bounce up and down like something like this, like an abbreviate? So if you look here, this bottom one right here is when uh, atmospheric CO2 would be the lowest during the year. So this would be summer. When it's the highest, like right there, that would be winter. Now, this kind of fluctuates with the seasons because there's more plants, which means more CO2 is being absor absorbed and converted to oxygen. Now, what the overall trend that we see here is you notice, okay, in the red, there's my line of CO2. Now, this blue one right here, I'm going to draw that in yellow. That is the overall trend of Earth's surface temperature. So what you're noticing is as we are increasing the CO2 concentration, we're also increasing our overall, um, our overall temperature of the Earth. Again, we're not looking at just Pottsville. We're not looking at just Philadelphia. We're looking at the entire world when we're looking at these numbers. Now, how this affects ecosystems is populations which are adapted to particular climates may be unable to live in certain areas because of the change in temperature. Temperature. So think about it. Our polar bear right here. If the polar bear, if our Earth's temperature as it continues to rise and the ice that they hunt on begins to become um, only available to them later and later on in the year, they're not going to be able to hunt as efficiently and potentially die off. You know, we can talk about the sea turtle. The sea turtles maybe are having 
to do with warmer oceans, which means there's less prey for them to eat, less jellyfish. So again, the changing temperatures could change how these organisms are able to survive. Now, with another thing that this uh, warming temperatures is doing is actually melting polar ice caps. Now, the more drastic looking thing would be these two pictures. So this is Peterson Glacier in Alaska. And what you'll notice in 1917, look at how big that glacier was. These are taken from exactly the same picture. And you can tell by like the mountain range right here, look. So it's the same little mountain. And what you'll notice is these glaciers are retreating. Now look how far back those glaciers are in the year 2005. So again, the reason that we should be concerned about that is these melting polar ice caps may cause sea levels to rise, flooding of coastal areas, and it's going to affect many of Earth's unique ecosystems. So think about it like this. Most of you guys may go to Florida for a vacation. Think about that, that, uh, that country. Now, think about it if this is, what, this is what would happen if every single polar ice cap would melt. Notice how that we have drastically decreased the amount of land available because of those rising seas. Again, this is the potential that could happen if we continue on the trend we are going today. Now, pollution is another thing that obviously affects ecosystems. Pollution is the addition of substances, objects, or other factors that cause harmful changes to our environment. Now, it could be air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution, but also noise pollution. Noise pollution can actually cause a great deal of damage. Now, all of these things cause some sort of detrimental change to the environment. We'll talk about it a little bit closer. Now, one of them that is associated with the water cycle is what's known as agricultural runoff. So agricultural runoff, when water runs over the surface, it picks up fertilizer. And when that fertilizer enters into an aquatic pond or lake, there's aquatic plants that will use that fertilizer and they'll grow uncontrollably. So in response to the added nutrients, algae pollution or populations may increase rapidly. And this is what we refer to as an algae bloom, where a big bloom of algae in a short amount of time. Now the increase in algae can limit a couple things, light penetration and, and reduce photosynthesis in other aquatic plants, which means that a lot of the food source will become unavailable. Now when one of the algaes, one uh, of the algaes use up all the nutrients. So once they use up all the nutrients, some of the populations uh, begin to die off. And what this does is it increases decomposition, which increases CO2 in the water. And what you get is a result of the killing off of all the fish in that location. So more decomposers mean the depletion of oxygen, the increase of CO2 in the water, which can lead to the death of fish and other aquatic organisms. Now, another one that is a very drastic um, result of pollution is acid rain. So acid rain is a very broad term and includes any form of precipitation with acidic components, such as sulfuric or nitric acid, and it falls to the ground from the atmosphere in wet or dry forms. This can include rain, snow, fog, or hail. But the damage with this is acid rain will actually increase the pH of streams, which can kill a lot of aquatic organisms. Acid rain can actually be strong enough where it actually burn leaves off of trees. So if you look at this, this is actually in Colorado, and this is an area that was hit very drastically with acid rain. Notice how the leaves are almost burned off. It's almost like a fire went through here. So acid rain can be very detrimental if the concentrations get high enough. Again, the more fossil fuels we burn with sulfur in it, the more drastic it will become. Now, another one that might be uh, pretty close to home, especially for me, since I live in the, uh, a coal region, is acid mine drainage, or AMD. Now, a lot of times, the nickname for this is Yellow Boy, because it actually turns the streams a yellow-orange color. Now, this water is not suitable for life because of all the acidity in it, and it will actually kill anything that lives in that water. So, this is actually a picture here from... Uh, Shemokin, part of the Shemokin Creek. 
Now, acid mine drainage refers to the outflow of acidic water from metals, mines, or coal mines. And what it does is it decreases the amount of organisms that can live in that stream very drastically, which is why it's a big deal where these coal mines have been abandoned. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is when humans or other organisms come in and they change an ecosystem, how does an ecosystem um, react to that? So we call this process succession. Now, biomes are dynamic, meaning they're ever-changing. So this process of succession is how these ecosystems change over time to a disturbance. Now, organisms that thrive during the early stages of succession are called pioneer species. Now, they call them pioneer species because they are the first species that enter into a location. So lichens and moss, when we have rock, those are the first ones that are going to colonize it. So here is a lichens right there, and here are some mosses. And what those things do is they'll actually break down the rock to create soil. Now, the ones that are found in the later stages, when it becomes more stable, are called climax species. So think of it like a mature forest. Think of it like oak trees, maple trees, big hardwood trees that are going to uh, have big broad leaf, big trunks, and support a lot of life. Now, ecosystem succession takes two forms depending on the starting point. Now, primary succession occurs when the new ecosystem develops when there was none before. So, in other words, we are st starting with bare rock. In other words, this could be like a volcanic eruption. This could be a parking lot. And what happens with primary succession is it's a much longer process. It takes hundreds upon hundreds of years to recover. And... This occurs, again, when there's nothing there, and it's a combination of wind, water, and pioneer species, such as lichens, that we are right here, that break down that rock until we eventually get soil. So when soil forms, now we're starting getting annual plants, we're starting to get shrubs, we're starting to get small things, and then keep forming more soil, grasses, perennials, then we get to the intermediate species, like grasses, shrubs, um, shade intolerant trees such as pines and then eventually we get to the climax community which is our oaks and hickory so once the soil has enough organic matter small plants and shrubs can be supported over time trees sprout um, trees become more dominant and we get those structures there now secondary succession is when the soil is already a place so again secondary succession is a much shorter process so in um, primary succession, it could take upwards of 300 years. Well, in this one, we're only looking at 150 plus years to get to our um, climax community. So this is when there's something like a fire, a flood, a volcanic eruption where the soil remains there. And in volcanic eruption, not a lava flow, but like just an ash flow or just a simply of clear cutting um, a forest. So we have some sort of disturbance, like a fire here. And remember, afterwards, at year zero, our soil is still there. So in other words, it can recover very quickly. So this form of ecological succession does not take as long because the soil is already there. So a year or two later, we have annual plants, grasses, then perennial plants. And then uh, within five to 150 years, we get those uh, intermediate species of the shrubs, pines, young oaks, and hickories. And then in 150 years, we will reach our climax community with our mature oaks and mature fir forests. Again, shorter amount of time because the soil is already present. Again, if soil is there, we don't need to spend the hundreds of years to break it down. Now, there are some other things or other factors that can actually actually affect the ecosystem, and those are things called invasive species. Now, in order to know what an invasive species is, we also have to know what a native species is. So native species are those that normally live and thrive in a particular community. They have natural predators, and they help to keep their populations in check. So in Pennsylvania, we have two organisms. This is the pink lady slipper, again, a flower, and also the red fox. So these are two organisms that are very common. They live in Pennsylvania, and they are found very often in these habitats. Now, a non-native species are species living outside of its native distributional range. 
which has arrived there by human activity, either deliberately or by accident. So non-native species are not necessarily invasive. So the one that we have is the multiflora rose. Multiflora rose was introduced here as an agricultural product to um, one, use as an ornamental plant, and also two, control erosion. They're also using it as living fence. In other words, instead of buying a barbed wire fence, they use the multiflora rose, which has barbs to it. The other one is a zebra mussel. Now, zebra mussels are native to Russia, and how they were introduced into North America is big giant um, freighter ships came into the Great Lakes, and these zebra mussels were then deposited there, and they have grown uncontrollably. Now, in order to be an invasive species, it must be a non-native species that adversely affects habitat and biodiversity of native species in that. So, for example, the emerald ash burrow actually has killed over 75% of all ash trees in Pennsylvania. So in other words, this guy has come in and severely impacted the ash population because what it does is it drills holes in the trunk in order to reproduce and feed. The other one is Japanese stilt grass. Now you've probably seen this and not realize it. They almost have like sharp razor-like leaves. Now, Japanese stilt grass, you're probably like, why would that be, you know, bad? Organisms could just eat that. Well, Japanese stilt grass, uh, grass because of these uh, silicon that's in their leaves actually can't be eaten by organisms. Therefore, they grow and there's no nothing that's going to eat it. And what they do is they outcompete those native species for that space. Now, invasive species push out or kill native native species and take over the population, causing loss of habitat, loss of biodiversity, and loss of native species. So this guy right here, called the lanternfly, is a big deal right now in Pennsylvania. And what it's going to do is it comes in and it actually eats fruits, vegetables, and could drastically affect agriculture and the amount of food in these locations. So again, invasive, nothing eats it, and it's also detrimental to the native crops of that area. Now, another problem we are seeing with humans as well as, you know, in general, is habitat loss. Now, what a habitat is, is an ecosystem area that provides the resources a species needs to survive and reproduce. Now, hab habitat destruction is currently ranked as the primary cause of species, species extinction, uh, extinction. If you want to see how many organisms are threatened by habitat loss, Go to a website called the Red List, and the Red List indicates every organism that is threatened, endangered, or um, on the endangered species list, list, even extinct in the world. Now, a couple examples of habitat destruction, ones that are natural, are things like fires. Now, fires can cause by a couple things, like lightning, but they can also be caused by humans. And humans, what they do, especially in the rainforest, will come in and just burn entire areas of the forest in order to use that as fertilizer to grow crops. Now, what this leads to is a process called deforestation. And deforestation is where the forest is completely obliterated and no longer exists. And in other words, it's cut down faster than it can replace itself. And it, this is due to clear cutting and unsustainable logging. Again, these are problems that are really pushing out organisms of the tropical rainforest, and we're seeing a huge loss of organisms from this. So hopefully this video helps you out how organisms are affected by humans, as well as how they adjust, adjust to changing ecosystems. So again, this is part uh, this is part six of your series. Again, uh, this one, part six of your topic eight ecology chapter. Hopefully this helps you out. This is Mr. O'Brien signing off.